Okay, we will, uh, well, happy Monday. It's week nine. We're uh, wrapping things up, I guess. Um, so this week we'll introduce PCA, Principal Components Analysis. And um, yeah, we'll talk about uh, kind of some of the, uh, the ideas and, um, and we'll introduce uh, some concepts here. Okay, so uh, this um, principal components analysis, you know, falls under the category of unsupervised learning in that you have a data set, there's no labels, you're not trying to predict anything. You are searching for some kind of structure within the data. Uh, the other example of unsupervised learning was clustering, and we saw k-means clustering um, and the EM, EM algorithm for kind of uh, clustering or grouping uh, values together into different groups. Um, another aspect of unsupervised learning is dimension reduction, and principal components analysis falls under um, the kind of the, the category of dimension reduction. So the idea is you have a big data set, lots of variables. Maybe um, maybe there's you know 150 variables or something like that, right? So this is again assuming uh, you have kind of numeric data. Uh, you've got, um, you know, lots of observations. So just imagine a very big data table, okay? And so, I don't know, you've got thousands of observations, maybe hundreds of columns, okay? And the question is, can we restructure the data um, in such a way that, it, that it's easier for us to think about, okay? So, you know, with 150 variables, our brains... It's, it's hard for us to keep track of all of these things, okay? We can keep track of just a few things uh, a lot better, and it's a lot easier for us to, uh, to do that, okay? So, um, generally, you're gonna have variables in your data set. Those are gonna be correlated. And what PCA is gonna do is it's going to transform the data into uncorrelated variables, okay? And so, you know, the goal here would be dimension reduction. If we take advantage of the fact that many variables are correlated, can we reduce the number of variables and still capture or convey the variation that exists in the data, okay? So here's a, just kind of a simple example is, um, I don't know, have you guys done like a housing data set in one of your classes? Okay, it seems to be like a fairly popular choice of data set, okay? So in the housing data set, depending on what you have, I imagine a lot of times you're trying to predict the price, okay, based on a bunch of variables, right? And as far as a house or a condo or an apartment or whatever, there's a bunch of variables. A lot of them is like, how big is the house? So it'll be like livable square footage and the total square footage, which includes the basement if you're not in California, right? California, we don't have basements, right? Or I don't know, just, yeah. Okay, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, you know, the lot size, if there's a pool, you know, there's other things, you know, what kind of roof, um, what kind of air conditioning or heating unit, you know, how big's your garage or how many parking spaces, when was it built, uh, how nice is the kitchen, how nice is the floor, how nice is the roof. Um, there's other uh, things like the zip code or the location, maybe the local school ratings, maybe the median income in the surrounding areas, median home price of the surrounding homes. There's all kinds of stuff, right? And if you had to kind of keep track of everything, you know, it'd melt your brain well, for most of us. <laughs> and. Uh, and I would argue that we could reduce a bunch of those things and kind of just give like a, a three number summary that's going to capture most of the information that you need about the house, okay? 
And I would say one is going to be how big is the house? Okay, is it a big house? Is it a little house? Something like that, right? And that's going to be things like the square footage, the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms. Those often go up or down together. Okay, if you've got uh, you know an 800 square foot house, okay, probably maybe uh, one bedroom, two bedrooms, or something. It's going to be a, a pretty small thing, right? And then as you go to you know to 1,200, 1,600, 2,000, you know, 4,000 square foot house or something like that, the number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, those are going to go up. Okay, so one thing would be the size. Another thing would be like, how nice is this house? Okay, and that's going to be related to um, either when was the house built or how recently was it remodeled? Did they, you know, how nice is the kitchen? How nice is the floor? How nice is all of this stuff? Okay. Because, uh, you know, on the market, you might have places that are known as fixer-uppers, or they call these investment opportunities. Um, and, um, and then you have the ones where, you know, after <laughs> the investment opportunity, now it's, uh, they've redone the floor and the, the paint and whatever, and now they're trying to sell it for more, right? And I would say those, those are often go up or down together. Okay, it's, it's not too often you have a really nice kitchen and everything else is like falling apart, okay? Uh, and then um, how nice is the location? How desirable is the location? Is it, it, are the schools in the local area good? Is the you know, crime rate low? Or is the uh, you know, local income level, you know, things like that? How, how kind of, you know... Uh, you know, maybe walkability index and, you know, how location to um, major uh, business centers and stuff like that. And I would say, you know, if you, if you, you can kind of re reduce this to just kind of like these three, these three things and that, that captures a lot. Okay. So you can kind of almost imagine like a video game <laughs> character selection screen, right? They'll say like, Hey, this, uh, this character has high whatever jumping ability and this character has high power and this one has high speed or something right and it's kind of like all of these things and they're just kind of reducing it so you can kind of make quick comparisons between things right uh, you know other things and and I don't have a slide for this but you know you could think about like a, an entire sports team okay and if you think about all the variables at play in a sports team there are lots because you've got you know, a roster of 30, 40 athletes, whatever sport we're talking about. And each of those, uh, you've got, uh, you know, each individual player has different, um, you know, abilities and stats and statistics and, you know, um, and things like that. Uh, so, but you can't just compare one entire team with another entire team by and factor in everything. So a lot of times there's kind of like these summary values, right? The, the, it'll say like this team has this kind of defensive rating, this team has this kind of offensive rating, this team has this kind of rating for this or that, whatever, you know, a lot of whatever sport you're uh, you're talking about. So like in baseball, it'll say like this is kind of uh, the pitcher <laughs> for baseball, it'll say like um, uh, this is a number that summarizes the pitching uh, abilities of the team, right? And so pitching is very important. And then the, here's a number that summarizes kind of like the batting ability, how you know how how often and, and whatnot, and, and maybe fielding. I don't know how that's often usually less important in um, baseball and stuff like that. But basically, those three numbers, if you can summarize those and feel like these do a good job of summarizing the uh, the different aspects, you know, now you can compare uh, a bunch of teams against each other. And stuff, right? So dimension reduction is helpful for us as humans who are really only able to kind of keep track of a few things at a time when we want to make comparisons. Okay, uh, other, I guess, other dimension reduction examples, okay? So uh, GPA, <laughs> one that you're familiar with, uh, basically it reduces, so the whole point of dimension reduction is to be reductive, okay? So 
there's pros to it, and then there's also some major cons to it, right? To, to be reductive is that, you know, a GPA, this one number is supposed to summarize your entire academic career, okay? All of your triumphs and all of your failures and all of that is just held in one number. And we don't know. We don't know what was going on in your life. We don't know that, like, stuff was happening, and that's why maybe your GPA is not as high as it might have been otherwise, or maybe, uh, you know, you took some really hard classes or things like that. Um, it just, but is it still kind of useful? It's still kind of useful in that, like, if you needed to make quick comparisons, if you have like a thousand students applying, you can kind of just use this one number as a quick filter, and then you can start focusing in on more of these details, right? Okay, same thing with SAT or GRE, you know, this complicated notion of intelligence, all of that gets summarized down to like your verbal ability and your quantitative ability, writing ability or something, you know, it's not great, but it's, it can be um, useful, I should say, okay? Okay, credit score, I don't know if you guys are getting credit cards and building credit and how all of this stuff works, but, um, you know, how trustworthy are you with, uh, <laughs> if, if you borrow money, are you going to pay it back and stuff? And this one number is supposed to kind of capture uh, a, a sense of that, okay? Um, in the NFL, there's a passer rating, okay? So you can take, uh, you know, the quarterback, you look at, how the quarterback performs in a game and includes you know how many like yards they threw and how many passes were attempted and how many passes were completed and how many interceptions which are bad things and stuff like that and it gets just combined into a single number and we can kind of compare like oh this person's game performance versus this person's game performance okay uh, another example you know like in the Olympics there's the decathlon and the heptathlon and those are like several different events, but when it comes time to rank them, you know, gold, silver, bronze, you've got to reduce it down to one value, right? So, so those are all dimension reduction things, okay? Um, an example of dimension reduction is the, the idea of a shadow, okay? Um, so here, uh, I have a pen, right? Okay, and if I if I put the pen, if I hold the pen like this, okay, the, the shadow that the pen makes, it's very clear, I think, that it, that it looks like a pen. You can even tell, like if you see this shadow, you can probably tell that it's a click pen and there's a little uh, thing, a clip to, um, Hold the uh, whatever you know. Clip it to your shirt. I don't. What do you, what do we use this thing for? Right? Do we do we clip it to our shirts? Okay. But um, so so this shadow is very telling. You can even see like a piece of hair that got stuck. Um, this shadow is very telling of what the object is in three D. Okay. If I rotate it a little bit though, we lose some information. Okay. We lose the existence of the clip, okay? We can't see the clip very well in the shadow, okay? And then if I do uh, something, and now my hand is getting in the way, okay? If I do something like this, it's very difficult to tell exactly what I'm holding, okay? It looks like I could actually be holding a marble or something like that, okay? And so, you know, when, when the object exists in 3D, in three dimensions, we, we, it's unambiguous what it is, okay? Uh, what we want to do is we want to basically create a shadow, uh, a lower dimensional projection, okay? So we're going from a 3D thing to a two-dimensional representation, and we want this two-dimensional representation to capture as much information about the original object as we can, okay? Same thing with, like, my hand, okay? With my hand, this would make it very clear that this is a hand, okay? But something like this, you lose a little bit about wh what exactly is this object. It's it's not quite um, not quite clear. 
uh, what it is, right? And so we could think of basically any three-dimensional object when we create a shadow out of it, we're reducing the dimensions from 3D down to 2D. And again, de depending on how this shadow is projected, the shadow may or may not resemble what the original thing looks like. Now, there is inherently going to be some information lost. Okay, So be just by reducing the number of dimensions. But we might be able to pick a lower dimensional projection that loses only a tiny bit of information. Um, and I think I think I tried to draw this. So I don't know. Here I have a picture of kind of a cylinder. And depending on how, you, how we project it, right, if you just kind of cast light, it could look like a rectangle. Maybe at certain angles, you can kind of tell that it's going to look like a cylinder. Um, so, um, so when we say we want a lower dimensional projection that resembles the original data, there's a few ways to think about this. Um, but what PCA says is to capture we want to capture as much of the variation that exists in the original high dimensional data. Okay. So you think about in if you have this high dimensional data, variation exists in the high dimensional data. And when we kind of flatten it, when we project it down, okay, um, we won't be able to capture all of the variation. Okay? But we want to capture um, as much of the variation as we possibly can, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to search for a lower dimensional projection that maximizes the variance in the projected space. Let me um, let me. This one is for least squares regression. But let's see if we can do. So here is an example. Okay. We have x and y. And x and y are highly correlated here. Okay. As x goes up, y goes up as well. And basically, we can project this down into here we we preserve so x the original data is in two two uh, dimensions okay and we could reduce it just down to one dimension okay pc1 will have uh, basically just uh, the amount of spread in um, basically along the red axis here right so this this red axis um, kind of if we form a new axis kind of coordinate system, we'll end up getting this, right? And this first dimension in red captures a lot of variation in the data. The green axis captures very little information. If I threw away the green axis, okay, we wouldn't actually be losing too much, okay? Yes, this one is a little bit higher, and this one's a little bit lower, and this one's a little bit higher in the green, green direction, but it's not it's not going to make a huge difference, okay? Um, and and if you were just given these values, you could kind of guess what both the x and y coordinates were, right? And you'll be off by a little bit, but not by much. Um, so in the original x and y, the data is spread out like this, okay? And then when we project it down, okay? In PC1, the data is spread out like this, and in the second principal components, the data are all kind of compressed together. So there's high variation here, very little variation over here. Okay. Um, here's kind of another example. Here's the data in three dimensions, in three dimensions, and we have a red, a blue, and a green axis. Okay. 
And so if you look at the data in any one of these um, things, this is kind of what it looks like, all right? Uh, this is what the original data looks like. And, and right now there hasn't, the principal components analysis has not been done, okay? So this was just, this would just be kind of, if we freeze it and we look at exactly, if you just kind of freeze it right here, this is the image that you see. And you can see kind of in the uh, green direction, or in the red direction, which is kind of in the same orientation here, we see a cloud of points over here and then kind of a dense cloud over here, things like that. And in the green direction, something similar in the blue direction here. What principal components analysis do, will do is it's going to search for an orientation of kind of these red, green, and blue arrows so that we maximize the variation in the first principal component. And then the other ones are going to be orthogonal to it, and, um, and it will still capture. So let me just kind of show you. And so this is simply just a rotation of what the red uh, of the coordinate system, okay? And so now the red kind of points along this axis direction, and this maximizes the variance captured. And what we see, even if I were to throw away the other two principal components, we would still see kind of the, the internal structure that there are kind of three clusters in, uh, in, this, uh, in this data. Whereas in the original coordinate system, it's difficult to tell just by looking at each of the coordinates individually that there are actually three clusters. Okay? The three clusters are kind of clear in this three-dimensional rotation. It's not clear when you just kind of look at one dimension at a time. With the principal components analysis, you, you start to detect the three clusters. You start to detect some of the original um, the structure within the data, despite it being reduced, the number of dimensions being reduced. Um, here's a, another example. Okay, this is a 17-dimensional example. And this, uh, apparently, they looked at the United Kingdom, so the United Kingdom consists of four countries, <laughs> and uh, so I guess it's one country, but also four countries, right? And this, so there's England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and, and they looked at uh, the consumption of different kinds of foods. They said, you know, how many, uh, how much cereal do you eat, and how, many, how much fresh fruit do you eat, and how much potatoes do you eat, and stuff like that. And if you were to compare the four countries and have to take into account all, all 17 of these things, and they say, hey, which one is most different from the others, right? We say, one of these doesn't belong, or one of these is very different from the others. Can you tell? So you might be like, okay, well, let's look at the alcohol. Okay, alcohol seems lower in Northern Ireland. Uh, anything else seems, right? But that's like we're just looking at one variable, right? We're often kind of searching for something. It's difficult to, for our brains to think about 17 dimensions at once, okay? So when we do uh, principal components analysis, this, this is what we end up getting. We get... Wales, England, Scotland over here, and Northern Ireland over here. So we do, it, it picks up something, and we go, okay, well, why is Northern Ireland so different, right? And so, yeah, okay, we see alcohol consumption is lower, all right? One other thing that, uh, that we notice is the inversion of the amount of fruits and potatoes, okay? And so, you know, there's, there's kind of a stereotype about Ireland um, and, uh, and potatoes and things like that, but that is indeed reflected in the data here. And so what we see is that in the three other countries, um, people consume more fruit than they do potatoes, whereas in Ireland they consume more potatoes than fruit. So that would be one thing that this would actually uh, end up picking up upon, okay? And, uh, and then, um, so that's the first principal component. The second principal component, um, 
again, not quite sure without looking at the loading matrix, okay, uh, to see what it, how these principal components are calculated. Uh, it actually separates Wales and Scotland uh, from each other, okay. Um, so that's that's what we want to uh, to do, okay, and and basically it's going to take all of these different dimensions, all of these variables that are correlated and it's going to create new variables that are uncorrelated. The new variables are simply linear combinations of the original variables. Okay, So we're not applying any kind of complicated function. We're just adding things together, maybe multiplying some of them by a constant. Okay. So, uh, you know, one simple way of dimension reduction is just add your numbers together. Okay, that would be that would be an example of dimension reduction in in a linear combination. Is you just say, you know, like uh, I don't know, on your I don't know if you've taken the GRE. Okay, but on the GRE, I think there's a verbal score a math score, a quantitative score, and a writing score, okay? And usually you just kind of report all three separately, okay? But a dimension reduction <laughs> technique would just be, let's add all three of these things together, okay? And, uh, and, and, and that would reduce from three numbers down to one number, okay? Now that's not going to work very well because on the GRE, I think the writing is on like a Five point scale or something, whereas what's what is it? Six point scale, okay. And then the verbal and quantitative things are on a I don't know what the max is, eight hundred, eighty something. It's a, it's on a, a very different scale, <laughs> okay. So if you just add them together, it's it's not going to work well, right? So you'd probably want to multiply some of these things um, uh, and and whatnot, okay. And uh, so anyway, that's um, that's one way to kind of think about it. Um, or maybe I don't I don't know how the SAT works these days. It's always kind of changing. SAT is two parts, math and verbal. Okay, there was a time where it was like three parts, I think. Okay, so math and verbal, and a lot of times you can just say, oh, this is my combined SAT score. Right, and if somebody reports a, you know, fifteen hundred combined SAT, you go, oh, that's a that's a good score, okay, and and we're just going to assume that both kind of, maybe, uh, and so, just by adding the two numbers together, that's dimension reduction. Now, if you want the details, okay, you could report the math separate and the verbal separate, okay. Another way you could think of it, though, that which would kind of provide almost orthogonal things is one is you provide the combined score and then you provide uh, like a subject differential score <laughs> okay so one way you could think of it is um, you know maybe positive numbers would indicate verbal was higher than math and negative numbers would indicate math was higher than verbal so you could say oh my total score is 1500 and I had a subject differential of 100 okay and that would indicate Verbal was 800 and math was 700 or something like that, okay? And you could kind of get the same information back by reporting a combined score and a subject differential value, okay? It, it's a weird way to think of it, but, but that, that's a possible way to kind of report, recover all of the information. So you have two dimensions. So you're going from two dimensions, math and verbal, to another two dimensions, but it's oriented differently, okay? And that's kind of what we're doing with principal components analysis is we're, we're going to search for a new orientation of our things. Everything else is just kind of a linear combination. So subject differential would be a linear combination of your math and verbal. It's just uh, taking a difference there. And then the total would be a linear combination, just adding them together. Um, but we're going to try to find one that maximizes the amount of variation. OK, I've been talking. I forgot. Uh, first view quiz answer today is D. D as in dog, D as in dog. I might as well give you your second one. Second one is E, E as in elephant. So D as in dog for the first, E as in elephant for the second. D and E.
Okay, so how do we search for this linear combination? Okay, so this is now we have to get math and matrices and stuff involved. Okay, <laughs> so so I give you the conceptual idea. Um, so we're going to say our original data exists in m dimensions, and therefore your nth dim nth observation. Okay, so our original data is y. It exists in m dimensions. Your nth observation is going to be, we write this as yn1, yn2, yn3, all the way up to ynm, okay, because we have m values and you got this kind of column of, column of values here, okay? And what we want to do is we want to project the data down to d dimensions, okay? So we're going from m being a bigger number, d being a smaller number. And after we project it to d dimensions, our data will be x. And the n observation x will be xn1, xn2, all the way up to xn d. Okay? So this looks the same, it's just m has, this is a longer vector of length m, and this is a shorter length vector of length d. So how do we go from y to x? Well, we take y and we multiply it by w, a matrix w, okay? Well, the w will consist of d different vectors. Each vector is length m, okay? So I can multiply w, which has length m, by y, which has length m, okay? And, uh, and the, you know, the first one will create kind of our first component. And then I've got d of these things, and so we're going to create basically d different values of x after multiplying w times y, okay? So for example, if y existed in three dimensions, and I wanted to project it down to two dimensions, I need to create two vectors of w, each of length three, okay? The first w is going to be how do I combine, you know, the y1, y2, y3 into such a way to create x1. And then the second vector of w will be how do I com combine y1, y2, y3 into the, your second component x2. So we're going to get a w1 and a w2, okay? Basically, um, two, two of these uh, length three vectors. And that will help reduce from three dimensions down to two dimensions. Is that okay? This, this idea of just multiplying w by y to form a linear combination x, right? And, that, and that's basically the, the basic of linear algebra in terms of just multiplying these vectors together. Okay, so PCA is now figuring out what is the w so that we maximize the variance, okay? So we want to choose the w so that the variance that we that's results in the projected space, that is x, we maximize that, okay? So the first vector, w1, will be the set of weights that go in that w vector so that the variance in the projected values are as high as possible. And the second vector, w2, will also maximize the variance, but it has to be orthogonal. Whoops. Orthogonal to w1. Okay, so w2 has to be orthogonal to w1. Okay, and so on. Uh, w3 will maximize the variance, but it has to be orthogonal to w1 and w2, all previous vectors. And basically, um, Oh, this should be i and j, that's a typo. This is a j right here. Anytime you multiply two of these vectors together, you sh they, they need to be orthogonal, okay? So for any i that's not equal to j, this is wi transpose wj, this is gonna be zero, okay? And then also, to avoid having infinitely many solutions, we're gonna restrict the length of the vector to be a unit vector, okay? Otherwise, <laughs> to maximize, we just pick the w's, you know, to be, you know, infinity or something. 
uh, huge and that will maximize the values. Okay, but we're gonna we're gonna restrict it to have a length of one. Okay, to basically find the directions. Okay, so um, one thing that will be helpful is to center our original data. So we're going to take our original data, y, and we want to center it. Okay, so we're going to just subtract the column mean from each column, and that's going to center it so that if I um, take the mean of the column now, it's going to be zero. Okay. So we're gonna um, we're gonna center our data, and for now, let's just work with the first vector. Okay, we're gonna work with this first vector w. So keep in mind y is of length m, and we're multiplying it by a w also of length m, and and right now this is gonna just we're looking at the first component, so it's just going to produce one scalar value. Okay. So if we say, well, what is the variance of the resulting x values? Okay, so I've got n observations in y, I'm going to have n observations in x, and, and each x value is a scalar. We can say, well, what is the variance? What's the variance of these resulting values? Okay. So here I'm going to say, okay, well, the resulting var var variance is. Well, we'll take the mean of x, we'll, ask, we'll take each value of x, subtract off the mean, square that, add them up. And here I'm dividing by n. I know in other definitions of variance we divide by n minus 1, but here, here we're just going to divide by n. Okay, now one thing is the mean of y is 0, and, um, and therefore the mean of x will also be 0. Okay, So if the mean of y is 0, so we can say, well, x bar is the sum of the x's. Each x is the result of doing w times y. And the w is not affected by, is the same for all n's, so I can pull that out. And if I say, OK, what's the sum of all of the y's? Well, that's going to be 0, right? or the mean of all of the y's. That's going to be 0. So w times y is, is also going to be 0. So the mean x bar is a 0. So that simplifies things. So now to find the variance, I can just do uh, the sum of 1 over n of xn squared. Okay, so this is, this is where I am. So now I have 1 over n. I'm going to replace xn. xn is found by taking w times y, w transpose y. And, uh, and it's going to be different for each of our n values. And so here. I got w transpose y n. This is a scalar. This scalar squared, okay, can be also written in vector notation as w transpose y n y n transpose w, okay? Because um, and so this this is what we have. And again, um, only the y n's are affected by the subscript n, so I can pull the w's out outside of the summation. So now I've got w transpose times. Y, y, y transpose, or y, n, y, n transpose, okay? This is going to be an m by m matrix, and then I multiply by w on the outside. Okay. So if we say, okay, well, what is this thing? This thing is equal to the covariance matrix, okay? If we say that y bar is equal to 0, then yn minus y bar, yn minus y bar transpose, this is, this is the definition of the covariance matrix, is going to just be this. Right? So this thing right here, which we said are the variance of x squared, is going to be w transpose. This thing right here, down here, is just the covariance matrix of y. Um, so we have this. Okay, So we have the variance of x is just w transpose times the covariance matrix times w. Is this der derivative okay? Or not derivative, der whatever. Calculation, steps, and all of this. Okay, so this is what we have. We want to maximize this variance. We want to maximize this variance and its 
subject to the constraint that W transpose W was one, right? Otherwise, I would just take W and blow it up to infinity and boom, variance maximized. Okay, but we're gonna say there's a constraint. W transpose W is one. So how do you maximize something subject to a constraint? We use the Lagrange multipliers, okay? Fun times. So, so here we're gonna say, okay, here is the thing that we wanna maximize. W transpose uh, covariance matrix W minus lambda times basically our constraint, W transpose W minus one. All right. And then so what do I do? I'm gonna take the derivative of this thing, set it equal to zero and solve for W. So the derivative of W transpose covariance matrix W is two CW. So this is kind of just your uh, vector derivative rules. And um, and the derivative of this with respect to w is going to be two lambda w. And solving, okay, now I get covariance matrix w is equal to lambda times w. So lambda is a constant, c is a matrix, and we want to find the solution to this. Okay, so to maximize. We said, okay, we're going to take the derivative and set this equal to zero. And now we want to find the w where this thing is true. So does this look familiar? Matrix times a vector is equal to scalar times a vector. And what is the, vec the value w? Okay, yeah, so when you have this, right, this form where c is a matrix and lambda is a scalar, then the w that's the solution to this is that w is an eigenvector of the matrix C. Okay? W is the eigenvector, lambda is the eigenvalue. Okay? Um, you know, so you find, what do we call that? The char characteristic equation and, and all of that, and you solve, and um, it, it might be helpful to brush off your linear algebra notes. Um, but we've got, so we have an eigenvalue eigenvector pair, and basically the eigenvalue eigenvector pair with the highest eigenvalue will be the projection with the highest variance w1. And then the next one will be the second highest eigenvalue will correspond to w2, and so on and so forth. Okay, so here w are eigenvectors of c, lambdas are eigenvalues of c. And so in short, the way we're going to do principal components analysis to go from m dimensions down to d dimensions is first we'll center the data. Um, optionally, you can also scale the data so they all have the same variance, okay? But it's not exactly necessary, but oftentimes it is recommended. Um, you compute the covariance matrix after you've centered the data. Then you find the mean, I mean find the eigenvalue, eigenpair, eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. Um, and if your original data, your covariance matrix is m by m, you're going to have m eigenvectors. And all you have to do is you just pick a subset of those eigenvectors, okay? The d highest ones, the d, d highest, um, the eigenvectors that correspond to the d highest eigenvalues, I should say. And then you just, uh, once you have that, you're going to multiply y times w, and that will give you your um, matrix of x values. Okay. So this is kind of just a conceptual introduction, and then on uh, Wednesday we'll look at some actual examples of doing this um, principal components analysis for the, uh, the purpose of dimension reduction. Okay, uh, let me give you your last Vuqua's answer, which is the letter C, C as in cat, is your last Vuqua's answer, and uh, we'll call it a day here. All right, um, have a good day. We'll see you on Wednesday.